Okay, so um, we have researchers from Poland and Lithuania and Greece. Um, there are a lot of researchers from Poland and Lithuania and Greece who are not here. To a certain extent, you people are a self-selecting group. Um, some of you are here because you are doing very good work and it is being recognized and you, you are being encouraged to come here and develop further. Some of you have had excellent potential recognized. Somebody has recognized that you have good potential and you should be nurtured and you should be created and, and pushed. I was very encouraged by some comments from the first table. There were words like passion and skills and interest because that is what we're here today. If you think people like you who are very capable and very driven, if you can take your skills and then you can match it with your passion and your interests, you know, your potential is raised considerably. As I said earlier, we have, this is our third day here. The previous two days we have been working with people whose job it is to support you. And we have some of the handouts from those over there in the corner. Nothing there is relevant to what we are doing today. But I thought because they were left over, it would be a good idea for you guys to see what people are saying about you. And, and to have an idea of what we are talking about. Um, I want to set the scene. I, I took some slides from what we were doing the last two days, just to give you an idea, because we all agreed that the poor researchers don't know a lot of things that people are planning for them, okay? What is research and development? The first part is knowledge and intellectual abilities. Discipline-specific knowledge, problem-solving, cri critical thinking, personal effectiveness, career development, which is what we are doing today, time management, research governance and organization, you know, being aware of how organizations work and how to get what you want through those organizations. Project planning, research grant development, research integrity, engagement, influence and impact. This covers public engagement, teaching, publication, impact awareness, outreach and enterprise. The importance of research and development. It should improve your ability to successfully complete your research program. And it should also prepare you for future employment either in academia or other employment. And one of the workshops yesterday, I got a fantastic uh, idea from my colleague over here, Justina. Um, could you pl please have a show of hands, those of you who would hope or plan to work in academia? Okay. Of those who do not plan to work in academia, would one or two of you like to give me a reason why? Your personal reasons why you would not like to work in academia. Anybody? Do you think maybe the competition is very stiff and is unrealistic? Or it does not appeal to you? You want to work in private industry? Well, for me, the reason is that uh, we have, uh, well, uh, for me, hours with students and uh, no time for uh, self-development and our own research. Yeah. We don't have time for research. We uh, have to do those exercises with students and no time for uh, ourselves. And uh, well, career is also important. Yeah. So yeah, and this is what we were discussing yeah. the last two days. I will show you some slides now that talks about the ideal for researchers. But the reality is very different. You know, they want researchers to do, develop soft skills and do training in leadership and public enterprise whole number of different things, but where are you going to get the time to do all these things? The answer is you don't. So you must choose what is best for you. And you must choose your own career path, develop your own career development plan, recognize your own training needs that will help you to get where you want. You look at this, this is from the UK where they have their voting, maybe they will be leaving today, but um, they do a lot of research on research um, careers. You look here, within three years, over half have completely left research altogether. And the United Kingdom would be considered, along with Scandinavia, Germany, maybe the Netherlands, to be leaders in researcher career development. And yet, look at these numbers. And look how many actually go on to be professors, less than half of 1%. This, this is the reality. So you guys are going to have lots of different career choices. And only a very small number of you will go on to work in academia. British government funded a review 
And one of the major recommendations was that major funders of PhD students should make all funding related to PhD students conditional on students' training meeting stringent minimum standards. Now they're talking about soft skills. Training should include provision of at least two weeks dedicated training a year, principally in transferable skills. Transferable skills are skills that you can learn here in higher education and then if necessary transfer to other parts, into the private sector, into the industry, into the public sector. Does somebody here is doing public policy, for example? The global context. Trends that will shape the economy over the next decade. Roaring rewards from innovation as the pace of technological change increases and countries move into higher value activities. The importance of higher level, level skills. They're going to need an investment in the science base, improving links with business so they can attract foreign direct investment, which is important, for example, in a country like Poland. Um, build high value added firms that will raise private investment. Engineering and physical sciences, they want highly skilled people are, who are most of important to help them from their research investments. And with industry warning of STEM skill shortages, it has never been more important to ensure our people have the skills most valuable to industry. We would like to further improve the quality of PhDs by increasing the proportion of students funded via cohort approaches. That means groups coming in at the same year, moving on and on together. EU funding. The Commission identifies the need to increase the number of researchers. This is the scary part. Stating that the EU will need at least one million new research jobs if it is to reach the R&D target of 3%, that the number of actual researchers required is significantly higher as many researchers will retire over the next decade. As a result, the European Commission calls on member states to strengthen their capacity to attract and train young people to become researchers so as to offer internationally competitive research careers to keep them in Europe as well as to attract high quality researchers from abroad. So we almost have a kind of Darwinian situation here where we are sucking in lots of researchers at one end, okay, and then we are losing that within three years over half of them. And we really don't know, when they, when they leave research altogether, we really don't know what happens to them. We don't know what kind of, of career they are having or if they are still using their skills. But you guys have very valuable skills at the moment and you are continuing to develop those skills within your research and within your team. So the important thing is for you, how do you keep those skills and apply them to do the kind of work and have the kind of career that you will feel fulfilled? Uh, I, how many of you are familiar with the Vitae, Vitae Research Development Framework? It's a UK body. And this is the type of thing that they are pushing now. If you look at this, these are the type of competencies they would like researchers to have. It goes from personal effectiveness, knowledge and intellectual abilities, engagement, influence and impact, research governance, and it breaks down into a whole series of subgroups. Now, this is not possible for one person to do all this, in addition to all of your own work. Okay? So this is why you must learn to be very choosy about where, what path you take. So that when you give your valuable time to get training, whether it be soft skills or technical, that it is the training that is most useful to you. So what we're going to try to do here is, today, is so that each of you will discover to a certain extent what works for you and what motivates you and what direction you could possibly go in in the future. This approach to career development and training is based on career coaching. It is determined by the end purpose of enabling you to make rational, informed, and appropriate career-related decisions. By raising self-awareness and a better understanding of yourself, you can identify what you want professionally. Hopefully at the end, when you finish this, you will be able to draw up an action plan on how you wish to proceed with your career from here on. This is done through exploring four areas, values, interests, personalities, and skills. Skills for you guys is the most important. So what we want you to do is understand yourself better, recognize and utilize the resources that are available to you in your own institution and within your own country, identify what you want and what is best for you, assist you to find satisfying work opportunities, not just any. You know, sometimes you are so busy and before you know your contract is up. And instead of, if you don't have a plan, you will just take any contract. So you go from the frying pan into the fire, and you get stressed, and this is how we do so many researchers. So we want you to make plans based on clear goals. We want you to take action to get what you want, solve problems and difficulties, 
process and address issues such as coping with an end of contract situation and change, work stress, managing relationships at work and work-life balance. Become skillful in how you manage your career. Because the one thing that we have learned over the last two days, and we all knew this when we came in, nobody is going to take responsibility for your career. It is each, each one of you will do that for yourselves because nobody else will do it for you. We will provide support through your own institutions, the Eurexis Network, and, and projects like Pipers will provide support. But this is for you, so what we want to do is to help give you the tools to do that. This is when you can't get what you want, you have to change, experience the satisfaction, desire for something new. We want to help you to bridge all the different gaps between what you, where you are now and where you need to be. There are assumptions in this process. The first one is people have the ability and freedom to make career choices. They can be involved in a range of work roles across their lifespan. This is true now more than ever. Um, our parents and our grandparents possibly would have had one job for life. And even as researchers, you will have different careers throughout your lifespan. Technology will make some jobs redundant. You will have to retrain and move on and do something else. And of course, the reasons why individuals enter particular occupations can vary. You guys are at the end of a long road. You may have decided what you wanted to do when you were 15. Uh, for different reasons, you may have gotten advice from a family member, from a career guidance. It may have been an interest you had from a child. Career decision making is not something that happens only once in a person's life, but is an ongoing process that might take place at any age. First skill, the first exercise that we're going to do is the most important for you guys, and it's skills. Um, this Piper's project is almost finishing. This is really the last official workshop, apart from what we're going to do in September in Thessaloniki, yes, right? And the next one coming up is called Top 3. And there was the first meeting for Top 3 back in March. And one of the big ideas they have come up with, and you guys are going to be one of the first people to know about it, is the skills passport for researchers. As researchers, your skills are your passport. They are a passport to your next job, to your next position, to your next contract, to international mobility. Whatever you want to do, your skills are there. Ireland is very fortunate because we are the last stop in Europe before we get to the United States. And we also are an English-speaking country. And our government has kind of dubious uh, corporate tax rules. So we have a lot of uh, multinational corporations in Ireland. They have their European headquarters. We were in uh, Microsoft before Christmas, meeting with the head of um, human resources in Microsoft. And they told us they spent four seconds looking at a CV. Every CV, four seconds, because they get so many CVs. What they're looking for at the very first page is your skills. If the skills aren't there that they're looking for, nothing else in your CV matters. It's very important that you not only have a full inventory of your skills, but your own, you understand how those skills can be used and how they can be applied. After you drop your list of skills, each of you brought your CV, I understand. You were requested to. This will help you to make your list. We will then divide the skills into motivated skills. These are the skills that you enjoy using and you want to continue using. If you're using your motivated skills a lot, you will be very happy in your work. Development skills. Development skills are skills that you have tried. You may not have a full use of them, but you know you think you want to develop them more. They appeal to you. Or they could be skills that you believe or you've decided because of your development plan that you will need to develop these skills in order to move on to the next level. Then we have burnout skills. The simple example of burnout skills, if you have a group of people working in an office and we find out very early that one of the people in the office is very good at writing letters, for example, then they are the person who writes all the letters. In the beginning, they enjoy it because they feel special. After six months, they hate it. You know, it becomes a burnout skill. They're, they're sick of doing the same thing all the time. And then we have skills that are not considered relevant or important. It is a, it's also important to take note of these skills too because they may not be important to you now, but for a job sometime in the future, they may be important. Then we go into interests, personality traits, values, and psychometric testing as well is also useful for this if you already have a chance to use it. And then hopefully, as I said, when you guys finish this, you will be able to develop your own action plan. So, we will move on to skills first. Many studies have been carried out by researchers such as Salgado and colleagues, etc. 
verifying that skills are a good predictor of job performance and therefore are a critical consideration when choosing jobs and future roles. Other research also carried out extensively on skills and their classifications, linking them with interests as a further predictor of job satisfaction. Okay? So if you guys can take out your CVs now, let's start to make a list of your skills very quickly. We will take about 10 minutes to do this.